And there's a second problem in Germany, which most people don't know what's interesting. For historical reasons, there is a, a completely private health insurance in Germany. And most of the affiliated people are, are public servants from the government. The reason is they had this health insurance between them as a private organization long before Bismarck created his social health insurances. So they were there first and they wanted to, to remain. They didn't want to die. So they were maintained. And today you can enter in Germany, you can leave the public system of the social health insurance and, and join a private health insurance, completely private, uh, if you earn more than 5,000 euros a month. It's not exact the figure, but I made it a, a round figure, 5,000. Uh, these people, once you earn more than 5,000, you can opt out of the public system and join a private one or don't join anything, just keep without if you think you are rich enough to pay a big bill one day. Um, it concerns about 11% of the population. It's functionaries because of historical reasons, and it's the state who pays their contribution, so it's not really them, and very rich people, and uh, what else? Well, artists or people like this with a quite high income. So 11% of the population. And their contribution to this private health insurance, which takes all your service, it's not complementary, it's, it's a supplementary one who replaces the other social health insurance. Uh, they pay on age, the age you have when you enter. The more you are aged, the more you'll be paid. And then your health status, they will examine you from head to, to, to bottom to see whether you're in good or bad health. And every little illness you have, you have to pay more and the number of co-insured family members. So if you have three children or 10 children or, or you're just, just alone, you will put more or less. So this private health insurance is very interesting for young professionals who are not yet married, who earn a lot of money, more than 5,000 euros, and have no family and are in good health. They will get a very good tariff. They will pay much less than in the public health insurance. The problem is if they change jobs, and they earn less than 5,000, they will have normally the choice to go back to the public one or stay in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in this private one. And eventually, if they earn just a little bit less, the public one will be more expensive than the private one. And from the private one, they get more benefits. As they are still young um, and not charged with family, they will probably want to stay in the private one, but there's a problem afterwards. Once you opted for the private one and your salary drops again and you should go back to the public one and you don't, from that moment on, you will have to stay all your life in the private health insurance. You can never ever go back to the public one. And when you are 80 years old and very ill, you will pay a lot of money for this private health insurance. So there is a, a stop the government joined in. So to make the people think if really they want to stay in a, in a private health insurance. Anyway, this is the traditional problem Germany had, a breach of solidarity between of the social health insurances tradition because they were constructed like this. So they could reform this and they did. And this inheritance of the past with this 11% of the population that private health insurance. Nobody would do that today, such an insurance, but they can't stop it because these insurances, their own buildings, their own hospitals, there's a legal problem, you cannot abolish it. It's very difficult, otherwise they would do it. So what was done in Germany, I put it in red because this is important. All this, um, the government made a reform that all these social health insurances they have to join a national fund for risk compensation. And it's very easy, that is a German word, Ausgleichsfund. There is a national fund which collects now all the contributions for all these 250 funds. So you don't send your money anymore to this fund, to your own health insurance, you send it to this national fund. And the national fund, they collect all this money and they have risk, uh, risk uh, how would you call this, risk rating. So they look into each of these funds, what are the affiliates? What is their age, the average age? What is their health status on about 40 or 60 illnesses? Uh, they know it because they have the reimbursement figures, so they know what the illness of the people is. So what is the average chronic illnesses and, and, and 
accident rates and, and heart attack rates in the people from the people who are insured in fund X, Y, and Z. And then they put it all together on a computer program. And what comes out is a risk ratio uh, redistribution. So the fund collected all this money, lets the informatic system work, and then gives back the money to each of these funds for each of its uh, member. They get all the money back for me, who is insured in one of these funds. It's not really true, but it's an example. But it will be more money for me or less according to what is the risk rating for my fund. I hope this is clear. So they have a sort of risk rating for all these different funds and then they upgrade or undergrade the money they give back to this fund that all the funds have the same sort of contribution for each of the members according to the risk of, of expenditure they have. So this eliminates completely the unequal um, imbalance between these different insurances. And the result is this reform was done. Um, so what I said here, you know, creation of this fund and then the fund redistributes the collected contributions to the individual, individual funds corrected by risk index. That's the right word, the risk index, the national risk index, which is constantly renewed also. They always rework on it every year. So the result 20 years later is, if you have public opinion polls now about people being able to afford care or not, Germany reports today after this reform with risk equilibrium, Europe's lowest level of unmet health needs. People don't say anymore, I can't go and see the doctor because I lack the money or the doctor is too far away or whatever. Almost none declares unmet health needs for financial reasons or other reasons. Neither in the lowest income quintile, and this is really an achievement, because if you do the same inquiries in France, about 20% of the people who say they have unmet, unmet health risks, they can't pay for the doctors, despite the very high health expenditure in France and the very big solidarity in the system. So this seems to have been a very, very intelligent technical solution. Risk equilibrium between the different health insurances. Uh, this is between the public ones, huh? but you can also include the private ones if you want. It depends on the law. So France has a system for, um, we had the same problem in France because we had a social health insurance system with different branches. And people dropped out of the system because too long unemployed or because divorced and uh, not working anymore. And the husband used to co-insure the ladies and now it's, it's finished. So France had a very old law on medical assistance, a law that dated from uh, 1800 and something. And it was abolished, it was more than hundred years old, the local law, the local mayor had to pay for the medical expenditure for the, for the poor people. This functions, of course, very, very badly because it was very old and not adapted. So in 2000, they abolished this law, replaced it by what they called the Universal Med Medical Coverage, CMU, and made it a legal right for everybody who earns less than a certain sum, who has a so tree short, income tree short. If you have less income per month, and according to your family members, of course, it's all counted, you are entitled to get this CMU, right? Which means you can, you will be affiliated to the health insurance for free. You don't pay contributions anymore. You are just a free affiliated and you have the same rights than any other person who pays. The same rights than I have who pay. And uh, so the same benefits like the paying affiliates. But there's an income tree short. It is relatively low. It is a little bit lower than the tree short for getting social assistance. So in addition, as France has a social health insurance who never completely reimburse the expenditure, only sort of 70%, everybody has a complimentary private health insurance in France. So we all insure twice, once in the mainstream public health insurance, the social one, and one complimentary private health insurance. So these poor people who are under the tree short, they are affiliated without paying also to the complementary private health insurance. 
So there is a law about it, the government organized it all, and the private health insurance has to accept the people who want to join because there are several. You know. they, they're not entitled to look how expensive you will be, how ill you are. They have to accept you when, they say, when you say, I want to go to your, your insurance. So if they are just a little bit above the tree shore, you know, 30% above, they get a voucher, uh, some money from the government to help them buy themselves such a complimentary private health insurance. So the poor people with poor income, they get free affiliation or a sub, sub, uh, how do you say, a subsidized, subsidized subscription. This is a basic form in, in, in France. So, um, and in 2016, this, uh, all this what was created in 2000 was merged in another reform with the main health insurance. So all these things about CMU doesn't, don't exist anymore. We merged it into the normal health insurance, a big one. So there's no difference now anymore institutionally between the people who are free insured or those who pay. You all have the same health insurance, the difference I pay and other people don't. And we get the same service and go to the same hospitals. So we call this the Puma reform. Puma is for universal health protection. There was another interest. So the, the CMU for the poor people was merged into the statu statutory, you know, the legal social health insurance. And another very interesting point in this reform concerns mainly women, not only. Membership is now individual. You are in the French health insurance. We don't know since 2016 any co-insured family members anymore. It doesn't exist anymore. So let's say you have the same couple, Mr. Y and his wife, Mrs. Y, and only Mr. Y works and she looks after the house and the children. So what will happen to her? <laughs> Well, nothing. Uh, formerly, she was co-insured with him. And when they got divorced or separated or when he would die, she was without insurance. And she had to run around many offices to get the right papers to be reinsured as a widower. Now, she will be insured on her own name. And as she doesn't have any income, she will be free insured without paying. And if she gets divorced or her husband dies, it doesn't change anything. She will still be insured in her own name without paying any contributions. And the day she finds work and she starts working, she will have to contribute. So this is just a sort of simplification administratively, but it's a big help for women. It really is to protect women for months and months without insurance for just administrative reasons. And it also works for grown up children once they reach the age that they can't be uh, reinsured with the parents anymore. They are individually insured and as generally they are students or they don't earn money, they will be free insured. So there are quite a lot of people now who benefit from this reform just being free, free, in, free insured. So there's a long history behind and it was sought in the way you merge it with the normal health insurance and you have three short income and individual membership. Now you may be curious about migrants, but all the people who migrate around in Europe and come to France, if they can prove that they are on the territory of France for three months, they will be free affiliated to this Puma thing, to the normal health insurance. But they have to prove that they are there for three months. If they are less than three months, they can still go to the public hospital. There is a special service in each public hospital for people who need medical help, who don't have papers, who don't want to give their name because they're afraid of the police, because they're illegal migrants. You can even go there without giving your name and you will get the care you need. Uh, there is a state medical emergency aid scheme. That's a, a money fund. The government gives some money in this fund and this fund will then pay for these people to the hospital. And you have, of course, humanitarian medical associations who will help. So basically, everybody is covered. It's just to give you an example of different types of coverage. In Germany, this works more or less the same way. The European countries, they consult each other, and they all have plans for migrants. They all have plans for these people who earn very little. And they're more or less sort of the same, but they have to fit into their institutional uh, makeup, architecture of the system. Uh, concerning migrants, of course, in Europe, many countries have different policies. 
or Poland, for instance, and Hungary are not very friendly to migrants, and they will probably not be so um, ready to give them medical care, but then they just need to go to another country next door uh, and they will get what they don't get in Hungary or because uh, free movement in Europe. So that's no problem. There are quite a lot of people in France who come from other countries just because they need medical care and they can't get it in the other country. So Netherlands, uh, you had uh, some reading about it, just to summarize, Netherlands had um, traditionally social health insurances, just like, like Germany. And for all sorts of reason, um, money-wise, and it was not very efficient, it was very bureaucratic, cost control and so on, they decided to privatize all of them. They made them just private. We just declared, now you're a private organization, you can recruit the manager you want. You just have to watch your own budget. <laughs> you're private now. And uh, then the government, of course, regulated very strongly their activity and especially that they would keep uh, universal access and ensure all the people who don't have money also. So in fact, they do this private, by privatization, they, they did the same thing than others did by risk mutualization or the French by free affiliation. So they made a law at the same time, the, the, the Dutch saying all citizens, all the people who are on the Dutch territory must be affiliated to uh, health insurance. And as they're all privatized now, it means to private health insurance. And the private health insurance must accept those who apply to them. The contribution, uh, this is interesting, is divided into two parts. One part of the contribution to that private health insurance is community rated. That means probably according to age groups and professions and things like this, you have a little bit different tariffs. And that money goes directly to that health insurance. And part of the income goes to a national pooling fund, they call it, that redistributes the money according to risk index to the different insurances. So it's the same thing that the Germans did, but the Germans did it for all the insurances, for all the contributions on a national level, and the Dutch did it for half of the contributions. And the other half continues on a basis of more or less private ideas, so the community rated contributions. Uh, it's not your individual health status, but your status maybe by age or the region you live or the profession you have. So there's a little bit of risk in, in, in it. And all poor people are free insured, the government subsidizes their affiliation. So if people don't earn money, they can still join these health insurances, although they're private, and the government will subsidize, they will send a, a fixed sum for each member to each of these insurances that they get some money back. And Switzerland, who is such a free neoliberal country, they adopted more or less the same system. They used to have only private health insurances and they, they nationalized them, they made them public and introduced more or less the same uh, things in Holland. So we can see the combination between public and private is not really important anymore. But such as important is that you have risk pooling between your insurances, that everybody in the country must be insured and that the very poor people are insured free. These are the sort of basis for uh, universal access as we see it in Europe. So we can uh, summarize a few points. The national health service systems are easier to monitor and regulate than health insurance systems because Government has direct control over all the three functions. You remember the nice temple we saw, regulation, funding, and distribution. The government in these, in these national health, care system, health systems can limit capacities, well, the budgets, the beds, the manpower, and the equipment. So it has all the power. And the result is waiting list, age limits for heavy, heavy uh, care. And in France, this doesn't exist. Oh, we have some waiting lists, but they're not really very long. And uh, to decide whether a very old person of 80 should have a new hip or of, of 90, it's the doctor decides, it's not the government, it's not the health insurance. So uh, hospitals get money for the work they do. So they're always interested in doing work. So they will give you a new hip, even if you are 90. They will just look whether it's reasonably on a medical stage, so that if they think it will be better afterwards, because there is a principle in, uh, in uh, medicine, which is uh, important in France, they keep to their traditional principles, 
prima non nocere. So a doctor should never do something which makes you uh, afterwards worse. So if you have some chance of being better with your new hip, even if you're 100 years old, they will give you a new hip and they won't bother at all about the cost. But that would be a bit different in Britain because there's more control over what should be paid and not paid. Social health insurances, Germany, Netherlands, and uh, Austria, and so on, they invented new efficient tools to avoid risk skimming by private health insurances, taking all the young people, huh? and correcting the traditional solidarity breach of the social health insurances. So they mean they introduced um, risk mutualization. Even if you have a, a thousand different health insurances, half of them private, you can mutualize the risk by the risk ratio factor, which you uh, use for redistributing the contributions. I hope this was clear. It may be a bit difficult for Indians to understand this. Even Americans would find it difficult. So a few words about co-payments. Uh, we have seen in our statistics that there are quite a lot of co-payment in the uh, poorer Eastern European healthcare systems. Uh, but I lined up a little bit general, general statements. In general, in the European countries, even the poorer ones, you have no co-payments or very little for people under income thresholds, and they're very, very little money, and generally they are free from co-payments. Out-of-pocket payments are generally annulated for chronic disease. Let's say somebody has a chronic heart disease or cancer, or chronic, which comes back and back, they won't pay you out-of-pocket, it will be annulated because they always need care or for very long and expensive illness. In several countries also, there are no out-of-pocket payments for children under 18 or under 16. Most countries uh, also limit the out-of-pocket payments, which you can sort of accumulate during a year, year, and it should not outpass a certain amount in a year. So people who need a lot of care, they will not be penalized for the fact that they need all the time to see a doctor and have a little co-payment for this. Sorry, ah, it always runs away. So in France, the limit is 60 euros a year. Once you have co-paid one euro here and six euros here and three euros here, when you have reached the 60 euros, the health insurance doesn't take any co-payment anymore out of pocket. So, uh, Countries did different rules about co-payments. Generally, uh, the out-of-pocket payments are concentrated on non-essential medicines and on things like spectacles, hearing aids, and dental implants. More expensive things, but which are not vital. Uh, except France, they introduced just recently in 21, in September, it's very new. You can get totally free without any penny to pay, whatever is your income, even a millionaire, free spectacles, free hearing aids, and free dental implants without any out of pocket for everybody. But you have to take a standard model for a standard quality. So the government negotiated with the, with the specialist, for instance, the eye, uh, the eye doctors, what type of spectacles needs this and this and this in this case, and what in average would they cost. And they made a list of about, I don't know, you have a choice, maybe about 10 different spectacles, and which are all good for you, for your, for your eyes and the glasses are okay, but it will be sort of average quality and uh, average sort of aesthetics. Uh, it's okay, it's fine. Uh, I must admit, I tried for my last spectacles, I, start, I, I tried the standard models, but I could see much better with the more expensive models, so I paid it myself. But it helps many people who just couldn't pay it. I mean, you get reasonable quality, uh, attested by specialists, and you can have it all for free. So afterwards, the choice you make, you want a new car or you want good spectacles. Okay. I will finish with this. After having said all I said, there's only one way to universal access in its full sense, and that is a compulsory health insurance for all residents in one country with health insurance bodies that share risk mutualization. There's no other way because otherwise you can't finance it. Health insurance is like any insurance. If you want to have a good insurance, you have to have lots of people who pay and very little who take the money out. So if you ensure the entire population, that most people are healthy, 
you will get enough money to pay for all the people who are ill. But if you don't have compulsory insurance or let part of the people get away with private insurances who don't share the risk afterwards, then you can't insure universal health care for all. Or you have a two-class system. You will have these sheep or medicine for the poor people free of charge. The good doctors won't work there. They will work in other private clinics. So you have to decide one day or the other if you want a universal access for everybody according to the rules of dignity of every human being. And in that case, the technical way to get there is compulsory health insurance for all residents without exception, paid according to income, not according to risk, and that all the bodies who ensure the risk share risk mutualization to avoid to have poor and rich health insurances with different care baskets. <laughs>